Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Today on The Final Bar, we will indeed wrap the week. We'll look at this short holiday week, Tuesday through Friday. What changed? What did we learn? Breath conditions continuing to deteriorate. We're seeing those leadership names start to take a bit of a pause in the broader market, taking a big breather. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Hope you're all doing well. Had a good week. As we prepare for this weekend, we like to look back and wrap the week and focus on what we learned. Today, we're going to talk about this sort of continued short-term rollover. A lot of the videos we've been doing uh, recently have been focused on sort of uh, what we would call, I guess, a, a rotation of sorts, a potential pullback phase. And what sort of markers we can track, what sort of indications we can identify that can help us anticipate that rollover. We've seen breadth indicators that were exceptionally strong. The NASDAQ 100 bullish percent index over 70 percent now back below. The McClellan oscillator had been above zero, now back below zero as of uh, Thursday's close. So a lot of the overheated signs have now become alleviated, which tells me sort of be in pullback mode mentally uh, going into next week. What does that mean and what key levels should we identify on the way potentially lower? That's what we're going to talk about on today's show. We also have some really good questions for the final bar mailbag. So let's get to our first segment, the wrap of the week. As we bring up the Stock Charts website, by the way, Stock Charts members, and if you're just bringing it up for the first time, you may know a, note a big green message at the top of your monitor. You also notice in the member tools section of your dashboard, you have a bunch of new information. We just had our deception pass release came out today. It was actually late last night, Pacific time that we rolled it out. We do a couple of releases a year. They're all named after geographical locations in the Pacific Northwest. Today's Deception Pass, which is a really pretty area in the San Juan Islands uh, in the uh, Puget Sound. And there's some really good content involved. Uh, so at the top, you'll see a green uh, message atop the, uh, the website. Click on See What's New. You'll go to the uh, landing page that has all of the information. It's new options data, new earnings data. Um, a really fantastic sector and industry analysis tool that we've added to our ACP platform, and also some previews of some really cool functionality, like a new invented or a new redesigned market carpet, uh, Sharp Charts 3.0. We've redesigned our charting engine from scratch. A lot of really cool stuff. So click on that green message at the top, and you'll uh, get more information on this uh, Deception Pass release. Let's look at what the markets did today. Uh, all, all said and done, a lot of red on the on the screens here, an overall sort of a move away from offense into more defensive uh, posturing. Uh, although in terms of sector movements, not as dramatic as you might expect, but certainly in terms of the price retracement, we're seeing everything come off a little bit. The S and P 500 finished just below 4350. That's down about 0.8 percent from yesterday's close on uh, on Thursday. So still above 4,300, still above the, uh, the August 22 highs, uh, still above the most recent breakout level. Look at the chart of the S&P here in a few minutes. Uh, so overall, still in an uptrend, I think, does the, based on any sort of general definition I could come up with, but certainly trading lower within the context of that uh, sort of medium-term uptrend that we've been identifying. The Nasdaq Composite pushed below 13,500 today, down about 1% from yesterday's close. So don't get me wrong, this is not a end of the world, everything down 3 to 5% in one day kind of session, but it was not going up. And I feel like in a bull market year, not going up is, you know, uh-oh, red flag, what, what does this mean, right? What's next? And, and overall, let's be patient, focus on the longer term trend. We're certainly in a pullback phase, I would say, uh, at this point. Mid caps and small caps feeling the pain, especially the small caps uh, S&P 600 down 1.7 percent. We had a really fun conversation yesterday with T.G. Watkins of Simpler Trading here in our studio in Redmond. If you missed that, uh, make sure you check out yesterday's uh, show because we talked particularly about small caps, that lack of small cap participation. Still underwhelming, to be honest, here in June of 2023. You're really not seeing the follow through by any measures looking at small caps. And that might be the most important area to watch. So higher beta small caps rolling over uh, yet again today. The uh, VIX is actually one of the few things in the green that we're going to talk about today, besides cryptocurrency, some other areas of the market. But VIX uh, moving higher, still, of course, very, very low relative to the last 12 to 18 months. We've talked about this low volatility environment, which is really more characteristic of bull market phases, to be honest with you. Sort of the 2021 playbook was a nice, slow and steady uptrend on lower volatility. 
That is what 2023 has felt like. Now, the drivers, the environment, very, very different. Um, but, but in general, from a technical perspective, a lot of similarities between those two periods. Let's look at some other asset classes here very briefly. Looking at the fixed income markets, you can see for the most part the yield curve coming off. Uh, we talked about the yield curve coming, uh, moving higher through the course of this week overall. Uh, today coming back a little bit as, uh, as the bond markets uh, rallied. So you know, one of the classic sort of defensive moves, if you would see stocks come down in a rotation into fixed income or gold, those sorts of, you know, sort of classic safe haven type of plays, kind of what we saw today here going into the weekend. So the TLT was up about 1%. 10-year yield uh, down about, uh, let's see, down to 374. Five-year yield dipping just below 4%. The dollar index up about half a percent. That's another thing to look for, right? Sort of that uh, the the challenging uh, environment of 2022 was marked by a strong dollar and a weak pretty much everything else, right? It was sort of the dollar we called the wrecking ball for risk assets. All the risk assets like stocks, cryptos, others in a clear downtrend, even bonds in a downtrend, and the dollar just ripping to the upside. So again, something to watch to see if we see consistent moves higher in something like the uh, dollar index or the dollar ETF. By the way, speaking of the dollar, one of the new enhancements we just added today, real-time uh, currency prices. We'd had end-of-day pricing uh, and now have upgraded our databases to handle uh, real-time uh, currency pricing. So those of you that do trade currencies, uh, real-time pairs and, uh, and spot currencies, all av available for you. Looking at uh, the commodity markets, the DBC down about 1.1%. Not a bad day, but certainly not a good one. Uh, copper prices down the most, about 2%. Although corn in the, uh, in the soft commodity space down about 5% today. It's using the Tucrium uh, corn ETF, CORN. Uh, crude oil prices, not too much of a change from uh, yesterday, down a, a bit. Uh, gold and silver both up about a quarter of a, of a percent. So another thing to watch, we, we talked over the, uh, the last couple of days about gold and silver really breaking down below a trend channel that had been in play since last November uh, and, and short term weakness kind of taking us below that lower trend channel line. You're seeing another uh, another move in that direction. Uh, sorry, you're actually seeing the opposite of that. You're seeing a nice rally uh, in uh, for now with gold and silver. That might be something to watch for next week, particularly if you get more of a risk off move, more of a pullback in stocks. That's where I can see gold and pr uh, silver prices starting to rally. A lot of green on the page of cryptocurrencies. And again, there's, there's a heavy news flow right now. Regulatory pressures, uh, institutions becoming you know, big into crypto and, and taking dramatic steps, ETFs being filed, all sorts of fun news, uh, news flow to, uh, to try and capture. At the end of the day, what are the charts telling us? Charts are telling us about a rotation uh, that had been bearish on things like Bitcoin and Ether, now to much more of a bullish rotation. You're seeing nice moves higher, you're seeing brief pullbacks, but overall, I would say when Bitcoin pushing above 30,000 now, again, sort of testing the highs from earlier in 2023, in a position of strength. The real question, can we get above 31,000 and push above resistance, make a new high for the cycle for Bitcoin? Can Ether get above 2,000, which is sort of that big round number, not too far above uh, current levels. But overall, a lot to like in terms of today's movements. And again, that's the latest move within the context of a series of moves that have indicated sort of a broader adoption, for lack of a better word, uh, with the cryptocurrency space. And, 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 and less uh, greater adoption, but more the promise of greater adoption. I think that's the long-term bull thesis for cryptocurrencies. Broader participation, probably light regulation that makes them more legitimized, but still unregulated enough that they are still true to what they are, which is a decentralized uh, form of exchange. So uh, for now, it's, we're seeing the uh, market tell us that that trend so far is playing out pretty nicely. Let us look at a daily chart of the S&P 500, just focus briefly on what we learned here uh, today. You can see uh, this pullback phase that we talked about. You know, what does a pullback look like from a technical perspective? We sort of had this big move higher. Turns out this might have been a capitulation day. Uh, this was, uh, let's see, Wednesday, Thursday of last week was this big spike higher. Friday came, kind of came off. And I remember that because I was, you know, after Thursday's session, I'm thinking we might hit 4,600 tomorrow with how much we're going vertical. And then Friday was sort of a come back to earth moment. We had the Juneteenth holiday on Monday, then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every day making lower lows and lower highs. That might be the story of this week. It's just drifting down every day. The range kind of moving a little bit lower. 
That is a pullback phase if I've ever seen one. And there are a lot of indications sort of back that up. A lot of things, including the S&P, were overbought. They are now out of that overbought region. That is pretty common with uh, topping phases. Now, there's no guarantee that it's an August 2022 pullback, a February 23 pullback, which was four to six weeks. And in some cases, uh, you know, eight to 10 weeks with a big drawdown in terms of price. That could just be a brief pullback to the breakout level around 4,300. The way that you differentiate them, you know, in my opinion, is have a clear what I call the line in the sand. For me, the line in the sand is 4,300. If we pull back and sort of chop around above 4,300, I have no problem with stocks sort of rotating around with a brief pullback. I would argue that's probably a very healthy thing is to put in, spend some time sort of in this range, put in a nice high or low, set ourselves up for a nice July. That makes sense to me in a lot of ways. We start breaking 4,300. That's where we have to engage some downside targets. That's where we have to think about what an 8 to 10% drop might look like, not just for the S&P, but for offensive plays that a lot of us have been riding very happily for the last six, uh, six to eight months or so, right? What happens when those things really start to give back those gains? Where do those uh, assets rotate to? Where do the flows uh, end up? And do we need to get more defensive? Is that enough of a move, enough of a drawdown that we'd rather be safe or at least protect from our downside? What's interesting is a number of my conversations this week, Bob Lang uh, from Explosive Options, I uh, made this comment, I think, with T.G. Watkins yesterday. We were talking about money management. And for me, money, when I say money management, it means have a good game plan. It's not just what charts look good or what stocks look attractive or what sectors might work. It's making sure you have an exit strategy when the market moves against your position, which is going to happen a lot in the investing world. So have a good game plan uh, now. 4,300, I think, is a decent line in the sand for something like the S&P 500. Let's go back here and just check out the uh, sector return. So all 11 S&P sectors in the red today. Communication services, the top one of the 11, uh, down about 0.2%, so not too much of a, of a down move. Healthcare number two, and that's an interesting one because we've highlighted some of the healthcare stocks that have actually emerged and been fairly strong here recently. So keep an eye on that one. Financials as well, down 0.4%. The worst performing sectors, utilities down 1.5%. Consumer discretionary, the XLY down 1.2%, technology down 1.1%. Let us uh, continue on now and go to the wrap the week chart. I actually have that over here. Here we go. So this is looking at the um, uh, major asset classes using ETFs for the most part and looking at uh, where we were last Friday and where we were today. As a reminder, this is a shortened holiday week with the Juneteenth holiday on June 19th on Monday. And then from there, we had four uh, trading sessions. So we're starting the clock on last Friday, the 16th. And what happened from there? In black, this is the S&P 500 which now finished the week with today's uh, drop down 1.4%. So not horrible, but if you look at the weeks that have happened in 2023, certainly one of the worst weeks in a, in a pretty consistently strong uh, market environment. So you know, the market definitely for now this week in a, uh, in a pullback phase. The NASDAQ 100 is here in pink, the QQQ, not too much different, uh, under, or outperforming by about 10 basis points, but that's 0.1%. Not much, and it's, uh, you know, again, down 1.3%. The uh, gold ETF, GLD, was down 1.9%. Small caps, the IWM, down 2.9%, very close to that. Crude oil price is down 3%. The worst performer is down here, emerging markets, down 4.2%. Two things were up for the week, the dollar and bonds, both about the same 0.7%. So those are two, UT, U, U, e, two ETFs, the UUP, which is a dollar ETF, and the TLT, which is a, a long treasury bond ETF, both up 0.7%. I did not include Bitcoin because if you incorporate that, you can see that all the other things are down here. Bitcoin had a monster week, up 17.3%. This is like back to the golden age of Bitcoin and its raging bull market, you know, where we're talking about 70,000 as the next step up to 100,000, if not a million in the next couple months. That sort of week this week with uh, Bitcoin having a positive one, about 17.3%. Uh, Again, I think the, the long-term bull case with cryptocurrencies is powerful. The, the other side of that uh, balance are the regulatory pressures. And we've seen a little of both in the last month. And I think that is the danger to that thesis of Bitcoin and, and Ether and other things just going higher consistently is it, we are one big regulatory decision away from these things tanking very quickly. I think that's the, the downside of a, of a volatile but long-term promising asset. 
Let's finish off looking at some of the uh, charts here that tell the story of the evolution of the markets over time. My market trend model is here on my dashboard. Still uh, bullish across all three time frames. As we pulled back today, I was wondering if we would get back below uh, the, uh, the, the sell line or below the bearish, uh, the, uh, the zero line for the short-term model. We remain slightly above it, and that's just looking at where we're at relative to the five-week exponential moving average. So still bullish, short-term, medium-term, long-term. And, and again, this is one pullback week after last week, which was a nice, strong week overall to the upside. Uh, so overall, the, the trend model that I follow is still bullish in all three time frames. If we get another week like we did this week, I would, not, I would expect the short-term model to turn negative very quickly. Uh, but for now, it's telling you long and strong, the charts are going higher. This is one just called the chart, which com combines five key metrics that I think are important to watch to get a good measurement of the overall health of the equity space. From the top, the S&P 500, again, even though it's in a drawdown, sort of on that medium term, couple months down the road sort of time frame, still a pretty good chart, right? And I think the reason that I would label it that way is because we keep making a consistent pattern of higher highs and higher lows. And particularly when we've pulled back over the last you know, nine months, we've made a higher low. And that's powerful, right? Get concerned when that doesn't happen. Get, get concerned when we pull back and don't hold the previous swing low. That is what we are not seeing yet. We're still seeing the trend overall on this longer time frame uh, still positive. The advanced decline line, a little less optimistic, right? And if you look, the uh, advanced decline line for the New York Stock Exchange made its high in February, the April high well below. So while the S&P was kind of retesting that 4,200 level, the AD line for the S&P or for the, the New York Stock Exchange well below it. Now we again made a lower uh, peak as we're making new highs for the year. So every time the S&P is making a new high, the breadth related to the New York Stock Exchange has been weaker. And I think that's a concerning reality of this market. Uh, and again, we talked this week a couple times about breadth conditions. You've seen a, a nice rally in breadth in short-term breadth readings, things like the uh, bullish percent index, percent of stocks above moving averages, but they're coming down to earth very, very quickly. This next series down is looking at the percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average, currently around 54% going into the weekend, coming down quite a bit from around 70% uh, at the end of last week. So you're seeing about a fifth of the S&P, that's about 100 names, rolling uh, below their 50-day moving average this week. Bullish percent index still fairly strong. Offense still doing fine over defense over the last six to eight weeks. So I think that's still a positive, but I'm just starting to see a bit of a rotation here. I'm wondering going into next week, if we press that to the downside, which would mean staples are outperforming discretion. That's more of a defensive read on the, uh, on the uh, equity positioning. That's it for our Wrap the Week segment. We're gonna open the final bar mailbag here in a few moments, but before we get there, just a couple brief announcements. First off, we'll be doing a webcast this coming Tuesday. I did a webcast uh, two years ago, in 2021, the raging bull market of 2021 called the Market Top Checklist. We did it over the summer. It was a brilliant playbook, I will say, because it helped us really navigate the end of 2021 and capture that rotation into the bear market phase of 2022. I would credit the checklist that we talked about in this, uh, in this webcast, which is part of my sort of normal bull market uh, analytical process, really helps you identify when that trend is exhausted. We're going to revisit that 2021 checklist, update it for this year, look at what the conditions are now, and make a decision together whether a top may be in or what we would need to see. So sign up for that free event at marketmisbehavior.com slash top, T-O-P. Also, the mailbag we're about to open is filled with fantastic questions from people like you. What are you running into as you're analyzing the charts, analyzing the markets, trying to position yourself, making trades? What are you running into? Let us help you. The final bar at stockcharts.com is our email. We're on Twitter, of course, at final bar SCTV. And on the YouTubes, just put a comment below the video you're watching. We'd love to hear from you. We'll hope to answer your question in our next mailbag beginning of next week. With that in mind, let us open the mailbag today. Thanks again for all of the great questions. And here is question number one for today. Dave, how do you use chart list performance view to narrow down your watch list of potential investment candidates? I really love this question because it, it, it addresses one of the features we've added earlier uh, this year, maybe the end of last year, which is the performance view. Let me bring that up here. So basically the way that you access that is, uh, let's see, go to uh, a, well, actually, you can do it in two places. You can do it in ACP or you could do it in, uh, in Sharp Charts. It doesn't matter. You just need a chart list. You need to start there. So I'll show you the one that's in the, uh, in the list here, and I'm going to use the Dow 30 stocks 
as a good, you know what, tell you, the S&P 100. Good list of names, a lot of different sectors represented. When you click on one of your chart lists, it brings you to what's called the summary view. And what's cool about this is you can click on columns, you can add different you know, things in here. So if you're looking for a particular piece of evidence when they're reporting earnings, you can bring it in there and then you can sort things based on scooter rankings or based on the percent change. You can really get through a list of stocks very easily. What you are mentioning is what's called our performance view, which is a really cool, simple table visualization to help you take a list of things and sort them in terms of different performance periods. We show you all of these different performance periods from one day all the way out to one year. And all you need to do is click on one of the uh, headings and it'll sort ascending first and then descending second. So I can see over the last month, Tesla, NVIDIA, Adobe are the top performers in the S&P 100, the OEX. If I click on uh, sorting from below, I can see Target, Kraft Heinz, and T-Mobile. Your question really gets to you, how do you use this? So what I would tell you is, you know, for me, this is not an ending point. I don't think I would ever look at this and say, what's up the most Tesla? All right, I better buy these five stocks. I wouldn't think of it this way, but I think of something, a performance table like this, as a way for you to understand. Now, you know, people, uh, my, one of my former analysts at Fidelity, uh, Mark Dibble, used to say, charts are the truth serum for the markets. A lot of times we talk about what should work, right? Gold stock should work, or gross stock should work, or small cap energy, whatever it is. The performance table actually shows you what's been happening. So on a day like today, look at the last week. And what I notice on something like this week, looking at the five-day performance, the top two stocks and actually three of the top five are all healthcare names. That's a bit of a surprise to me. The healthcare sector is one that I've not been normally thinking about. The only time I've been thinking about healthcare is when I've been scanning for ideas and names like Merck or CVS pop up on the scan. And I'm like, oh, it's kind of an interesting one I want to deal in, dig into a little more. That's how I would use the performance table. Look at the last week and see what's been working. Click on the chart to see what's actually been playing out. When I look at the chart of Merck, Pretty solid setup. And what I like about it is a long-term uptrend. It's pulled back recently and now rallying off of a previous support level. It's making higher lows and we're coming off of a higher low. Maybe this is something I want to look at as, as a potential position going into next week. Maybe that's on a watch list of things that I would do. So that's kind of how I would think of it. These would be the names that I would not, I would never probably pull the trigger on United Healthcare just because it came up on this scan of, or on this list of top performers this week. But it would tell me, okay, UNH, this is a chart I should look at. If the chart looks compelling, I want to put it on a chart list of watch list ideas. And then next week, that's my group. That's my uh, on-deck circle. And I see which ones I want to put up to bat and put into my portfolio. So things that I often do are five-day performance, just looking at the last week. Looking at year-to-day performance is something I've done all the time. And what you can imagine uh, right now, it's a lot of the growthy fang stuff at the top. But a lot of times it can help point you into different subtle themes that may not have been relevant. So I would encourage, go to different timeframes, look at the top of the list, look at the bottom of the list, and see what surprises you. Dig into those charts, because those might be the charts you're not looking at normally on your own. Maybe this points you to some interesting ideas to dig into a little further. I hope that answers your question. And thanks so much for asking about the uh, performance view. By the way, in ACP, we have a very similar version. It's in the uh, sort of uh, table uh, below your price charts. Question number two. Dave, is resistance better looked at as a zone or band or as a specific horizontal line? I love your question for so many reasons. And I will tell you, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, and I will tell you, uh, as you may guess, if you've watched the show for a while, I'm a big fan of support and resistance zones. That's why in my chart of the S&P 500, I have some horizontal lines, but the really important stuff are ranges. And Arthur Hill, a couple of years ago, showed me a really good tool to use because I basically, I thought he was just using really thick lines. I'm like, how do you make your lines that thick? That's because that makes sense to me. The way you do it is you click on the annotate button and just use a rectangle. And then when you do that, I'm just making up a range here just, just for illustration purposes. You can basically make the little rectangle. Just think of it like a shaded area. And then what you want to do is make a lighter color. So pick a color that you want, like uh, purple, and then just drag this slider back so it's kind of a lighter shade. And what that allows you to do is see the prices in the background, but just kind of shade an area. I think this is a super important concept in modern technical analysis. 
the great literature of technical analysis, Edwards and McGee, John Murphy, Martin Pring, uh, and others talk about specific levels, trend lines, and how important that line is. And make sure you don't break the line in any reason. Use the intraday highs and lows and don't adjust them at all because those are fact. I think the reality is those were all written at a time when prices were less uh, granular, right? You didn't have sub-penny trading. You had 12 and a half cents at least. I mean, at, 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 at most, that was your, your smallest gap between two trades was 12 and a half cents, an eighth of a dollar. Now, of course, we can go sub-pennies. We can go thousandths of a dollar. And so the, re the idea that we would hit a particular point in time precisely and rotate, I think that implies a precision to technical analysis that is completely unreasonable. I think it's the same as thinking a PE, a PE hits 21.000 to three decimal points, and that's when you want to buy something. I think it's more ranges. I think there's more wiggle room in terms of valuations and price action. So that Arthur Hill trick that I shared with you is just a way to visually recognize and admit to yourself that these are not precise levels, they're more ranges. And I think thinking of them that way opens up the door to getting a whipsawed a lot less often, to recognizing shifts in supply and demand and when things can just narrowly overshoot or undershoot a level and that's kind of okay. Uh, that's how I would think of things. Now, I am not, I've talked to people who come from more of an engineering analytical background. They do not like that. They're more left brain and thinking, no, it's a mathematical truth. You need to hit this level. I definitely am more of the right brain creative side and would, and would definitely agree that there are more ranges. I think it's more of an idea uh, than a uh, more of a guideline than a than a hard and fast rule. So that's how I would think of support and resistance. And I hope that helps answer your question. Next one. Is there a way to scan for stocks that have changed their scooter ranking the most? I love this question so much because it's using the scooter rankings, which is a proprietary stock charts technical ranking tool. This is something that uh, we provide the, uh, the the formulas for, of course, but it's a it's a list that we keep. It's a basically a simple quantitative model based on price momentum on multiple time frames aggregated into a percentile ranking for different universes. And I think it's a really powerful way of focusing on stronger and weaker areas of the market, depending on what kind of questions you're trying to ask. So if you're looking for stocks with a scooter ranking that's improving, two things I would point you to. Number one, the easy way, sort of the blunt instrument approach, would be go to Charts and Tools. We have this page that we keep updated every day called the Scooter Reports. Pick your universe at the top here. And then down here, go to like one week change. That's kind of a basic, uh, you know, basic uh, time frame. And then sort on this column right here. And this is basically showing you the, the change in the scooter ranking over the last one week. And I can see which Scott's ha stocks have gained or lost the most uh, based on their scooter ranking over the, last, uh, over the last five trading days or the last one week. Now, if you want to do something a little more uh, fun than that, you can use the scan engine. Now, this requires you to be a little more comfortable doing, not doing heavy coding, but, but certainly looking at language like this and not uh, you know, sweating. So if you're more of that type of person, just use the scooter report. You do the one week change, that's probably good enough. But if you're more, you want to get into the weeds and try to really focus on more nuanced changes, we have an article in our um, support center called Sample Scans. The way you can find this, by the way, if you copy this URL or you want to bring it in, you're, you're welcome to do it. But if you search stock charts and just type for sample scans, so click the magnifying glass, look at our support articles, you'll get to this article. This is a series of, uh, of contributors, including our founder, Chip Anderson, basically shared uh, a while ago. These are some of the common scans we find people try to do. And here's the syntax you use to do it. If you look down on this outline to where it says scooter scans, you'll see a bunch of things that you can do. And literally, this is how you look at a scooter crossing below 30. This is the scooter rising more than 20 points today, a new six month high for the scooter ranking, a consistently high or a rising scooter ranking. So using this syntax, using percent numbers, just simple numerical values, you can use our, our uh, scan engine to customize a scan on a particular change in a particular universe. All you need to do from here is just copy this text directly into the scan engine that's updated, that'll work, and just uh, check the syntax and run the scan, and you should be uh, good from there. The scan engine, by the way, can it's a, it's a um, rabbit hole of cool things you can do. It's easy to get a lot of moving parts in there and can be confusing. Hit our support desk if you run into trouble. They're really good at this and can help point you in the right direction if you need. A lot of these sample scans can help you uh, figure out the right way to ask the scan engine the right questions. 
Next question. I love this one. This is an interesting. This is a first timer. I, I think. How to identify and trade Darvis boxes using stock charts? I love questions that force me to dig into my uh, like my history of of random technical indicators and approaches that I don't use, but I've heard of at some point. Darvis boxes, and I should have prepared a little more for this, but my recollection, uh, Nicholas Darvis, I want to say, and um, uh, what was the story I was going to say? I, Darvis boxes, from my understanding, is this. There is a very simple version, which is what Nicholas Darvis, who is an amateur trader, investor, had great success, and he used this methodology called Darvis boxes, uh, what they're called. There are a lot of more modern takes on this. Uh, and I've seen people try to automate it. And I've seen, um, you know, different uh, third party providers try to create some automatic Darvis box tool that uses some algorithms to figure out where the boxes should be. But I'll show you what it generally does. A Darvis box, it, the way that he uses it from, from when I first learned about this and read about it, was basically doing a simple uh, technique. And, and if I remember, I think this was in the 50s and 60s, maybe, when he was doing this. I might be fudging this, so I, I apologize, Nicholas Darvis, if you're still alive and if I'm, I'm butchering your story. I'm so sorry, but I think this is right. The basic concept was you take something like this, right? You think of a, a congestion area, what we would call a congestion area uh, or a basing pattern, right? The stock moves, and then it sort of has this consolidation period. That is when you put a Darvis box. And, and literally the boxes he created were just to look at the base and just show that this was a sideways move. And then you wait to see when it breaks out of that Darvis box. And when it does, that confirms a new uptrend and you leg into the position or you buy into it or whatever you want to do. And, and it works pretty well. And, and basically you only want to own things where the boxes keep getting higher because what that means is you have a move and then a consolidation, a move and then a consolidation. And if you keep buying things where those consolidations are getting higher, you're owning things that are in big long-term uptrends. So I think it was a simple methodology. It reminds me of like the turtle methods, which were like very simple momentum-based uh, strategies, but they worked brilliantly. Now, the critique of something like Darvis boxes is they worked really well when he used them because it was during a raging bull market period. And, and you could kind of say the Dave Keller moving average strategy is buy every time we pull back to the 50 day. And it works really well until we're in a bear market and then it gets absolutely crushed. And I think that's the challenge with something like uh, the Darvis box approach is it works really well if a stock isn't a consistent uptrend. As, as Greg Morris, one of my mentors, uh, would say, all new highs are bullish except the final one, right? That last one is the end of the move. And I think that's the challenge with this. But if you, so how would I use something like this? If you see the market as being in a secular uptrend, as you see names that you think are strong and you're looking for when would be a good time to, you know, you know sort of recognize that the trend is confirmed higher, something like this would, uh, would work maybe a little better. Now, again, having said that, that is the simple version that I remember from uh, first looking at this approach uh, a couple of years ago. Um, there, there are more automated versions that I've heard of people doing. I don't know a lot about those. I can't really uh, speak to uh, any particular uh, approaches relative to that, but that is the idea of what are called Darvis boxes. I would loosely call them things like a consolidation area, a basing pattern. When we talk about bases and breakouts, that's kind of what we're doing. We're channeling uh, Nicholas Darvis, uh, and again, I believe that's the name. And I apologize again uh, for if I if I mess up any of that sort. But that, that's my recollection. Next question, and this will be the final one of the day here. If you had 100k cash sitting on the sidelines, where would you put it right now? So of course. Standard disclaimers, not a recommendation. Please do your own homework and consult a professional uh, before you're doing anything with anything that you own or uh, are considering owning. You know, how would I approach this kind of kind of market? So, I, you know, I, a lot of the videos that I've done, a lot of the, the content we've talked about on this show on my own YouTube channel called Market Misbehavior, a lot of the content we've been talking about recently deals with the fact that the market has been in a very strong uptrend led by a small group of huge growth companies. And I think that is the reality of 2023. A number of people have talked about how the breadth conditions have improved recently. I don't know if I 100% buy into that idea that we are in the clear because the breadth conditions are starting to turn higher. I'm, I'm thinking back to my conversation with um, Doug Ramsey of Luthold, I think that was last week, where he said, actually, look when breadth improves at this point in the cycle. It's actually a bad thing because it tells you those big leadership names are starting to cool off. I think the reality is our benchmarks are so tied to those mega cap um, uh, stocks, those mega cap growth stocks, that when those start to struggle, 
I think look out below uh, for the markets. And I, and I think while we're seeing, I think while we're labeling this current pullback as a brief pullback for now, for now is an important phrase to put at the end there, because I think very quickly this becomes more of a watershed decline or a waterfall, waterfall decline. I'm looking at the breadth readings here. These are the advanced decline lines. They don't look particularly good. The S&P's advanced decline line has made a new high for the year, but all the others are still pretty bad, and the small cap 80 line does not look good at all. It hasn't looked good since February 1st or so, and uh, continues to be in a downtrend. So I'm not encouraged by broad participation that's getting better. I'm more discouraged by the fact that, um, that stocks that have been leading the way higher are starting to take a break. So what would I think? So the, I, I would say the first, uh, the first way I would have to answer that question is it depends on your time frame, right? When people ask about positioning or how should I play this, that is a very personal question in terms of what game you're trying to play. If I'm looking at the next five days or the next five months or the next five decades or the next five minutes, my answer to that question, of course, could be vastly different. My normal time frame is looking a couple of months down the road for an active trading account. That's kind of the, the time frame that I tend to think about. So with that in mind, I am hesitant to, you know, to play much alongside here, given the run that we've had, given the fact that it's run, uh, been run by such narrow leadership, given the fact that the breadth conditions are now deteriorating. I think we're more in wait and see mode. I wouldn't be surprised if the summer is more choppy, frustrating than anything else. So what I would probably do is have a mix of defensive things like gold. I probably would go for gold. Um, I would go defensive like bonds and something that I think would be uh, differentiated from stocks. And then I would look at leading names that are still working and I would focus incredibly uh, carefully on um, relative performance. And I'd look at stocks that are working. Areas of the market that I still think are good, and again, it's interesting, it's areas of the market that are still good whether or not you think they should be. Things like home builders, things like semiconductors, I think are still okay. And while you could get a pullback, I'm inclined to follow those trends until those trends reverse. What I would not be doing right now is bottom fishing and, and thinking of this as an opportunity to add additional longs. I, I think it's too cloudy of a picture. And while that may play out, I'm happy being more patient and waiting for uh, a recovery. But for now, given the run that we've had, given the overextended conditions that are now alleviated, I think it's more of a time to be protective and have cash on the sidelines for later uh, when I think will be a good opportunity to buy, in, uh, to buy in a position of weakness. For now, that's how I would approach it. I'm curious how all of you would answer that question. By the way, put a comment on the video you're watching. Let me know. Would you, would you answer that differently and why? I'd be very curious to see what you guys uh, would think. With that in mind, folks, we've got to wrap the show. Let's go to that three and three. Three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. Can I get to it? I did. Chart number one is the McClellan Oscillator. I, I, th this is a chart that has become pretty popular when I've showed it because, and again, it's just a, it's a simple like thumbs up, thumbs down, but I love the simplicity of a visualization like this. I sent out an email to um, uh, my newsletter. It's a free newsletter. You can sign up at marketmisbehavior.com. And I basically shared a Peter Lynch quote, which is never invest in any idea that you can't illustrate with a crayon. And that is a true quote from Peter Lynch. And I will tell you, having worked with him uh, directly for a time, uh, that is exactly how he would approach it. There's such a, there's a great intellectual rigor behind his investment process, which was very successful for quite some time, but also a simplicity. It was simple. It was good companies with good products, with good growth prospects, done. Full stop. What's the basic idea? I like having a simple red light, green light. What are the conditions right now? The reality is, as of Thursday's close, and I think echoed with today's uh, weaker move, the McClellan Oscillator is back below zero. I've highlighted in red when the McClellan, McClellan Oscillator has been below zero. In late April to late May was the last time that's happened. That was the first time in the last 18 months when the market hasn't pulled back more when the McClellan Oscillator is below zero. So I think of this as a pretty consistently helpful sell signal. That's another reason why I think being defensive and just uh, and just expecting downside, protecting from uh, from downside movements, I think is a, is a uh, it's an opportune time to have that thought process if you've not done it already. Chart number two, I was uh, thinking about the question about performance tables uh, before the show, and I brought this up just to look at the month-to-date returns. How has June actually been? The S&P in the month of June so far up about 4.1%. These other sectors like uh, healthcare, like technology, like communications, services are all up 29 to 3.7%. 
So why is the S&P up 4.1% if all these other big sectors are down? It's because here's the XLY up 9.4% just in the month of June. Of course, this is a cap-weighted ETF. So Amazon, Tesla, Home Depot make up over 50% of the XLY. Amazon and Tesla having a pretty strong week is going to power the XLY up. And again, a lot of these gains have come uh, from earlier uh, a couple of weeks ago. We had a big acceleration uh, with a lot of those names. So the XLY really a top performer, if not the top performer in the month of June. Finally, ticker CE, this is a commodity commodity chemicals name, Celanese. And if you look at this, this uh, reminds me um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the question, you know, what do you, what do you think is the toughest environment? A bull phase, a bear phase, or a sideways phase? And whether or not you tend to be more bullish or tend to be more bearish, I would say sideways markets are the most frustrating because you just don't have a directional move. It's not like it's moving against you and you get a clear signal to, you know, uh, to cover shorts and go long. It's not like the market's tanking and you hit stops and you just sell. A sideways consolidating market, it's like everyone's just sitting on their hands waiting to see what happens. It's kind of boring and it happens way more often than we probably would guess that it does. This chart of CE, you can see a clear, what's called a coil pattern or a symmetrical triangle pattern. Lower highs, higher lows, sort of coalescing around $110 a share, which is where we're at right now. The RSI is net neutral. In some ways, these charts are frustrating, but they're also very easy because all you're waiting for is a break out of that coil. Do we break above the upper bound or below the lower bound? That could be the momentum signal you are waiting for. Folks, that's a wrap for this show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. All of our previous interviews and episodes are on our YouTube channel. And by the way, don't forget the new Deception Pass release. Go to StockCharts.com for more info on all these great new features. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, and we'll see you next week.